Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. It's a great honor and privilege to be welcoming our good friend. And I think some, if someone, there's a lot of background noise. So if if people that are here speaking don't mind muting themselves, that would be great. All right. Yeah, was... probably me. I'll... Okay, Rick, nice talking to you. See you, Los. Bye. Um, all right. So like I was saying, thank you so much, Rick, for joining us this evening. It's been it's a great honor and privilege to have you join us all the way from Canada. So and thank you all so much for joining in this uh, joining us this evening. Um, for any of you guys that are unaware of who we are, we are the Chicago Graphic Design Club. We've been around since 2020 and we started as a organization that puts puts together a lot of these type of talks. And, uh, and we're happy to add Rick to our roster of amazing people that we've that, that we that we got a chance to learn from. Um, we just recorded a podcast not too long ago with Rick. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to that, it's available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all those streaming platforms, just look up underscore and um, and you'll be able to find it there. Um, before I hand the mic over to Rick, I do want to just point out that yes, yes, since 2022, Rick has been living in another country. And although he's no longer in Chicago, I think his presence is still is still felt here. And, uh, and it's a great honor that he's, he's among one of the designers that's featured in our upcoming publication faculty. Um, yes, he's also been yes, while he was practicing design in Chicago for over four decades. He was one of our canon's most distinguished designers. Yes, he remains a keen observer of the design-driven culture. And yes, Rick does hold some sage-like wisdom that could be of value to many of us here in Chicago and, uh, and to, to the future generation of design here in the city and abroad. So with that said, Rick, I'll hand you the mic. Um, this will be recorded, so if anyone wants to revisit some of the stuff that he'll be talking about, there will always be the opportunity later. So the mic is yours, Rick. Thank you, Christian. And thank you for the opportunity to be like the State of the Union fluffer. <laughs> right? <laughs> yep. I, um, I, I just want to say in advance of me turning on my, my uh, babble machine, that at any point, if there is a question, just interrupt, okay? That's the, the best way to do it. Otherwise, I will assume no one wants to talk and no one has any specific topic they'd like me to uh, whatever, tickle, and then we can just keep going, okay? And but I do want to, well, is I'll that good? Yeah, I was gonna say, and if someone's shy and they don't want to speak up, you could also drop your questions in the chats and, um, and I could read them out to you, Rick. So that's another. Oh, question. that'd be good. You do have a couple of questions already, I know, but you didn't share them with me to keep the suspense alive. I do want to just step back for a second and say that after the uh, podcast, and it's interesting, I don't know whether you do this with all of your guests on underscore, but on this particular occasion, Christian, you thought it was a good idea to invite me to talk with you at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. I think the first note you sent to me was can we do it at nine in the morning and i didn't think that maybe that was a uh chicago time zone issue but in any case i said well, come can we do it at 10. um and i just thought that's pretty fresh that was a, a fresh way to sort of get things going for me usually it's in the afternoon or the evening uh but i think i had an unlimited amount of energy that day and i remember writing you two days after saying you know, to tell you the truth, Christian, I can't remember a thing that was spoken. And your response to me was something to the effect of, I've scrubbed through it a couple of times and there was lots of laughter. <laughs> so I'm sorry. It was a, I was in a good mood. On that uh, conversation or in that conversation, I remember sharing a story about a critique I received from Saul Bass. And the critique was because I, I sent to Saul Bass who I had never met, a nine and a half minute VHS tape of a film I had produced. And when he calls the studio, it was Barb who answered the phone and she shouts out, she goes, there's Saul Bass on the phone. And of course, everybody was like, what, Saul Bass? And he asked me if I 
he acknowledged he received it, wanted to know if I wanted a critique. And he said to me, uh, I see you loved every frame you shot. Now, I never once since that call, and I remember that like it was yesterday, thought for a second that Saul Bass was, you know, being hard with me. I thought, wow, that is just such an insightful Yoda-like critique. Because he nailed it. I was in love with every frame that was shot. How could I possibly edit these things when we spent time in the photo studio making them happen? But brevity, you know, <laughs> it goes a long way. However, in response to that comment, I received from a friend of mine named Brian Mullen, who's living now in Bourbon, Indiana. And Brian had been an intern at Thirst for a couple of summers. He went to the uh, University of Indiana, and then he went out to... I think that's where he went, University of Indiana, maybe Purdue, one of those schools in Indiana. And then he went to New York and then he went to San Francisco where he was working in collaboration with David Edgers, Eggers. And he writes, listen to you and enjoyed the underscore podcast yesterday. Good to hear your voice again. Saul Bass, can you imagine, imagine delivering words so cold to someone? It was a different time, I guess. When I taught at CCA in San Francisco, fellow profs would crit like that and snide, I'd roll my eyes and laugh. Well, I, is somebody saying something? No, I think so. No, go ahead. You're oh, that's okay. In any case, I just said, ah, well, maybe Brian has a point, but I don't think I'm going to give uh, Saul Bass the biggest benefit of the doubt and say, he was nice enough to call me. I'm the winner there. I got a call from Saul Bass, right? I'll never forget that. So that's good. I wanted to just say that. And hi, Brian, if you're listening. So I also wanted to say that yesterday, the URL that defined uh, the presence of uh, my practice and the practice of a number of designers in the city over almost uh, three and a half decades, 3st.com is now sold to a supply chain business in India. Now, the upside <laughs> is that the uh, URL, or, or I should say the content of that site in its entirety and functionality will relaunch at the Art Institute through the Ryerson Library because they have some um, software that captures all that code and they will store that in perpetuity. So I'm particularly proud that that's going to happen. And shortly after that uh, launches, there'll be a retooling of rickvalisani.com, where I'll have a chance to just post old and new things that sort of tickle my fancy. Uh, today, I am not um, running a studio. I'd like to say I'm part of a network of talent. I'm enjoying this part of the design practice now more than I have in a really long time. Really, it's just so great to, well, not only be sort of like, in the basement of this house in a uh, house that's built originally in 1894 in Toronto. But more to the point, I am uh, working on things that I wanna work on. The typos that I'm chasing are my typos. The strategy, if you will, that I'm delivering to any particular project or its reason for being originates for the most part with me. I have one consulting gig. I have one and a half consulting gigs but the half one is uh, quite easy. And uh, I try to do my best never to open up InDesign unless it's for me. So there you go, that's what I'm doing. And of late, I have been asking myself this question as I dabble in mid-journey. I ask, am I spending time or am I, am I wasting time? And this was a question that I learned a number of decades ago from a uh, really brilliant guy who used to work at Leo Burnett. His name is Todd Leaf. And um, it's, an it's a kind of interesting question to keep asking oneself as a creative person because it forces you, at least it forces me to be focused on what is it that I'm doing and why am I doing it, right? What makes this use of the valuable commodity that we have and becomes more valuable the older one gets what makes it a good use of time and uh i'm 
sort of answering that question with something quite simple, which is joy. You know, am I getting joy? Now there's moments in any career path where the undulation of, you know, happiness and joy sort of oscillates like that, right? And sometimes you want the lows to be higher lows, just like the stock market as it goes up like this. But sometimes, you know, the reality of the, the situation sort of feels like this, at least for me it did, as there was always the voices that said, dude, you need to like define your practice or yourself differently. You need to do it with the number of people that are working with you or the number of uh, dollars that you might earn in a year or the number of square footage that you pay rent on or the number of desks that you have. And all of that sort of led to this chart, right? And that chart says uh, most amount of money, least amount of joy. At least that was happening to me. A little bit of money and then if i want a lot of money maybe most amount of pain so i sort of like being in this datum right down there that seems to be the the happy spot so as i mentioned i was working or have been working in um mid journey now i know i know it comes under a lot of shite and anybody who follows it on instagram or on the web will go, you know what, all that stuff just looks like uh, nonsense and crap and whatever. And I will tell you that as a subscriber to their publication, of which I just received the first, my first issue, which is their issue number 10, uh, last week, I looked at it and I thought, oh my God, this is so familiar, this kind of artwork that they're showcasing. It looks like the kind of artwork we would get in those uh, at a time when it was like pre-web and we were looking for resources that were photographic or illustrative and they'd send these books, these showcase books that the illustrators would pay to have a page or two in. And it looks just like all of that work. And I thought, there's something wrong here, right? The best that this program or the best that the people developing this platform can deliver is that which we've already seen three decades ago. And the truth is everything that we see on that thing for the most part is familiar because it's drawing from the familiar. We live in this post original world and it's out there scrambling. So the question I keep asking myself of late is how can I double Dutch with this platform and sort of get closer to a sensibility that I'm crafting? Right, Because this mid-journey, for those of you who have ever practiced art direction, art direction or creative direction is quite often a little different than doing design. At least that's what I found. The art direction usually starts with, you know, some sort of sketch. There's the sketch I want. Now I'm going to go find somebody to help me make it or I'll figure out how I can make that sketch come to life myself. Now, I thought I could, and I'm practicing this, revisit that methodology using Midjourney as the image maker that I have commissioned, be it the photographer or the illustrator. And what I've discovered is Midjourney is the kind of uh, collaborator that you have in your studio and they prefer to just be in the corner. They wait for instructions, i.e. your prompt, and they come back to you with stuff that's either completely off base or mind-blowingly fantastic. But you have to, like, again, double dutch with them, and you guide that process into a pre-visualization that may have suited your sensibilities and the project that was at hand. I'm finding that challenge to be 2,400 plus illustrations that I've done later, and they keep track of how many that you've done. I'm finding that process to be both exhilarating and exhausting. Just crazy making, because some of the stuff that I see, I can write a, a prompt and I try to write prompts that have only text, that I'm not ever sending a picture, I'm not directing to another website or whatever, link. I just wanna see if I can have a conversation as I might have done in the past with someone and describe that which I see. And so I find it fascinating. And so if you'd like, I could click through a few of those 
uh, recent things. Would that be of value? That'd be great. Yeah, okay, do. thank you very much for the permission to do that. I will happily do that. You know, if you've received uh, the first issue of faculty, you will see that there are uh, seven uh, AI images that I have. You know, yes, I, I return to sort of like printing them out, right? Sometimes they're kind of trippy. I look for the trippiness, right? Here's the emojis. And I really did just sort of invite AI to answer my question, which is, you know, I was thinking about distributed type in a bento box called the California job case, right? There's little pieces of lead type in there. They're all ink, they're black, they're by point size, they're by type style. And, and they're certainly by the location in the box. And you know that each of those characters has expressed some message before. And then they were, you know, redistributed back into the box until they were called upon. So that's like the emojis, right? You keep clicking the same emoji, the one that goes like this, right? Or the heart or the happy one or the crying one, whatever it is. And you ask yourself, God, what's going to happen in a few years when that emoji gets tired, right? Or more to the point when whoever is putting out that platform of communication decides to change that emoji, where does the old one go? So I asked that question and look at the shit that it delivered here. These kind of like, some of them are, oh, sad, and juicy, how they became juicy. I ask it to be three-dimensional. So I'm now playing to animate, but I've got like hundreds of these things. And this is the craziness of that person in the studio. It's like, oh, oh my God, just calm down, right? Everyone's different. How does one pick? And the way I pick is like, oh, well, maybe I want to have like four across, five deep. Oh, it decides it's a good idea to do six across. Well, what the hell? So that's one thing. Now I'm going to show you some stuff on the screen. So I'm going to share my screen. Share screen. I have a folder for you here. Let's see if I can find that folder. Ah, hold on. You go to the desktop. Uh, somebody showed me this today. Three fingers down, no, three fingers up, wherever it is. Okay, forget that. Rick, do you have a certain approach when you're prompting or how has that evolved as you've gotten more familiar with the tool? Now, that's a good question. Uh, I try to write as little as possible. I have, I've been on the uh, YouTube streams that are, you know, people teaching you how to write it. And my, my prompts sound something like this. They sound exactly like art direction. In the upper left-hand corner, on a white field, right? That kind of thing. And then I will describe what I want to see. I will tell them at the beginning whether I want it to be rendered or whether I want it to be photorealistic. Uh, I will talk a little bit, maybe one mention of like a, a bright uh, modeling light or uh, a soft box light or sunset light. But it's never specific. I've seen people actually tell you the camera lens and uh, the kind of light that they want. And then I end with the the aspect ratio code dash dash AR space um, three colon four, two colon three, 16 colon nine. And then now of late, it's like space dash dash uh, V space 6.0. So that's version 6.0. Um, that all makes good sense to me as well. But that's about the extent of it. I try to keep them seriously short. Seriously short. So let's just go into, here we go. I call it brains. Oh, let me tell you a little bit. Since I'm not running a studio here, I am having, oh, let's, let's share the screen. Sorry, you weren't seeing anything. Isn't this fun? I do, we're gonna get off of this screen here in a minute and we will walk through the space, but the desktop here, good. I'm gonna share the desktop. Participants can now see my screen. Okay. Here we go. I get to work with people that I've always wanted to work with. This is Eric von Blocklin in The Hague. And we were working on a, a piece of typography or he was doing most of the work and I was just chatting and controlling. That's Gary Fisher, the mountain bike guy. We used to work together and reunited. 
on the talk of another project. Uh, this is a good one here. This is my favorite collaborator down here at the bottom in the center. Her name is Anna Mort. And we'd worked together since 2014 at Thirst. There's Eker Gill over there on the lower left and a fabulous photographer, James For Foria. Ah, James, I can't pronounce your last name. Sorry, I blipped, but that's James. This is uh, my friend, Greg Parsons. We worked together as I design direct his staff of two at uh, Jacuzzi as we introduce a new thing. These are the folks at uh, Letterform Archives when the Strike Through book was happening. And there I was on a panel discussion. So that's kind of very cool. And here's my friend, Mohammed Dardiri. He's now in, I think he's in Dubai, or Abu Dhabi. He's originally from Sudan and spent some time here in Chicago, which is where I met him. Okay. And this is from a class this morning at Pratt. That was the chat room. Okay. So now we're going to go into those are my Zoom mates. And here we go. So I'm going to blow the screen up. Ta da. Megathang. So <laughs> I've been asked by a friend of mine at Classic Color if I wouldn't um, be interested in kind of donating for free my time to make some superhero cards that he could print. I thought, well, that's a kind of odd request. I said, yes. But I said, here's the deal. If I'm going to do it, I don't want to be chasing anybody else's typo. That's my sort of phrase. And, you know, you can give me the names of the characters, but I really want to be the one to direct them. He goes, fine. He said, you can even name some of these superheroes yourself. So the first one I named was, this was the card I gave him, Megathang. All right, that was my drawing. And uh, so I, I said, I'm going to make that in, in uh, AI. And sure enough, here's Megathang right there after a, a couple of attempts. And then I discovered that Midjourney has a hard time spelling. So I do have to now go into that Photoshop thing with the AI generative right in your request function that they have now. And I'm going to turn those C's into G's. I think Photoshop can do it. In the book that uh, <laughs> came out with the Chicago Graphic Design Club, there's this image over here. Let me see if I can get it here in my screen. That one of the little guy, right? I wanted to have a, a test tube character. Like, what is the future of AI figure making? And I was reminded of the uh, Invisible Man. Well, that prompt looks not much different than what I just said. And it came out with no arms. So I brought it in the Photoshop and selected those two areas. And on both of them, I just said, you know, just put some lightning or something. So when you look at that picture, that's the very first rendition that Photoshop did. And I went, okay, that's the best we got going right now. So let's print it. <laughs> let's keep this moment. So that's Mega Thang. And here is a superhero that I got the name because I'm the parent of two poodles. And this is Pierre Poudel. And Pierre Poudel, I don't know exactly what he does, but there's Pierre looking back at us. And here's my sketch for Stardust. This was a word they'd given me. So I drew that sketch while I was on the Zoom call with them and said, oh, that's pretty cool. But then when I rendered it here, when I described this drawing, that came out. And I looked at it and I went, wow, that looks a bit like that Rod Stewart album cover that Doug Johnson did many years ago. I forget what decade that was. I thought, well, I don't want to do that exactly. So I, I pushed at it a bit. There it is big. I mean, it's pretty glorious. Then I said, well, what, what does the face look like? So this one I got kind of excited about. And after a, a number of iterations, to your point, how do I modify the the prompts as I move forward, I modified the prompt to give me this sort of uh, ripple in the background here. I modified the prompt to make the skin almost uh, opalescent and metallic. And I'm gonna use Photoshop's AI thing to get rid of this obvious street scene here and this sort of uh, standard oil building or whatever it's called now in Chicago uh, thing and just put a twinkle 
because those things just look a little too real for Stardust. So that should print very nice. But I've been playing with, you know, make it do type. And this piece again in the uh, in the publication in faculty, I described it on the podcast. Right, this page. Can you see that there? Yeah. That page of type. There we go. Let's get it right. Okay. That page of type again looks like a Marshall Tucker band belt buckle from the 80s. It's completely illegible. And all it was supposed to say was high wire. It doesn't say high wire at all. But in any case, this one here, I wanted it to say high gloss. And notice what it did with the word gloss down at the bottom. And uh, I did describe that typography as, as if it was from an appliance, right? Like a Frigidaire or a Thunderbird. Couldn't get it. There's a close-up on her. I'm working on press sheets. That's the extent of it. The folks that I'm working with, uh, Adam Hernandez, he also took a, a sw swing at this sketch, and this is what he got from Mega Thing. I thought, oh, that's pretty interesting. That's like a public persona of Mega Thing. Oh, yeah. So this one here, let's see. Oh, I did that. I love these sort of magical forms. Don't know exactly what it was. This is I was working on when I was doing the insert for uh, faculty. As was this, but I didn't use it. This is a wooden superhero. And I think these are kind of a dime a dozen, you know, that I think the mid journey had just sort of pulls it into the normal portfolio clip art bin and delivers this kind of stuff but occasionally you can describe a polygon pattern and there it is right that's beautiful image or something weird and goofy like this with perfect teeth another polygon bedazzled i did this for my wife's new novel that she's self-publishing on amazon's press and the the book title is called Professor Vertigo. And so I just said, well, let's do something in that Saul Bass Vertigo uh, poster. I didn't point them to it, but I did reference it. And then a, uh, a female falling. So I knew I could turn that upside down. And I thought, well, I'll put those together in Photoshop. I never did. Uh, this I thought was interesting. This was also part of the search for the perfect superhero. Another one. This was uh, an early rendition. You know, it just gives you the weirdest stuff. And it's like, no, no, that's not so cool. This was the early rendition of the portrait for Stardust. And so whatever prompt I had of these little particles surrounding someone's head came out looking like this, like a weird hairstyling image you might find in a beauty parlor. When someone was asking me, you know, what is the difference you experience in Toronto over Chicago? I found myself saying on a number of occasions, the difference I see is there or feel is I don't feel so much rage. I don't see so much beauty, but I don't feel so much rage. And that turned out not to be so true, even though they have road rage, unlike anything I've seen, but for videos from Moscow, uh, it's kind of weird. But uh, this one came out and it was really the image that gave birth to that image in the publication, which is being uh, sort of a placeholder for civility. And the question that's being asked is, what's happening to good old civility? And I'm able to use this. I would never have done work that looked like this at any reasonable expense without this. Even this, I thought, oh, what if I'm like uh, designing an insignia for a high school team? I ended up really wanting to do an insignia for the two poodles that are in this house. And uh, I started here with this one. I don't know why. And there's another rage image. So that's it. But then this is what I look at. I look occasionally at these sort of website things. And this guy in the lower left corner is, uh, I don't know his name, but uh, he teaches me a little bit about writing prompts but he's so deadly serious and he's commercialized this already. I can't imagine that when we were doing, 
uh, the early days of the Macintosh on our desktop, that the tutorials would be commercialized so quickly as, as this is happening right now, whatever, you know, we're all sort of like buying self-help and um, I haven't purchased any of that. I, well, I shouldn't say that. I did purchase a tutorial on Midjourney. However, I haven't looked at it yet. And the other tutorial that I purchased was Paula Scher's um, tutorial on Maestro. I think it's a BBC production. And I did watch most of that, which is awesome. I just love Paula's passion and insight and generosity here in sharing how to make something. So that's what I wanted to show you on the screen. Okay, we've done that, going backwards. So if you missed anything, boop, boop, boop. Ah, ah, here, I'm gonna open up this folder here. Let me just see if I can open up a folder. No, I have to open up the folder this way. Here we go. Let me pull this back into the screen. Okay, can you see that okay? This is where, for all of us typographers, this is where I have found Midjourney to be. This is uh, asking it to spell Pierre, as in Pierre Pudel, correctly. And you can see it actually rendered my prompt in the artwork. And I said, I'd just like it to be in a kind of French script. This was another one that came. I said, like, lose the color. It's like, oh, boy. I don't know. It's a bit like a cartoony version of really fine calligraphy. And then I said, okay, I want it to have an image of the poodle. And this is what came back. Let's see. It's like, oh my God. But I thought, oh, that would make a really good floor mat in our house. We'd have two of them. And here's the outtakes of Pierre Poudel. Right, a superhero that has a mask that's made of like animal skin. Kind of weird, but look at that hair. And look at the ruff around their neck. I ask it to put a Salvador Dali mustache. <laughs> right here, this was like, make it look like an old tin type. That's so sweet. And weird, weird, right? Would your illustrator come back to you with these things? Maybe, would you be thrilled? Absolutely. Would you try to redirect them? Maybe, but in Mid Journey, you can redirect them however you want. I love this guy. Pierre Poudel. Here it comes, we're getting to the final one, right? Back in time, the original the OP. <laughs> kind of trippy. There it is. So I've invited my friend uh, Paul Sitch, who's a typographer. He runs a studio here in Toronto called Faith.ca, C-A. And they don't call it CA, they call it C-A, as opposed to COM. We never say dot C-O-M. But in any case, um, Paul is going to do the typography on these superhero cards. And I thought at some point I might need to like talk about the origins of the poodle. It's not a French dog. It's a German dog. Uh, so I thought, well, I'll just, if I need prompting. And so I took that screen grab of the top old small cities in Germany. Okay. And you saw all that. Okay. We're off with that. All right. And let's just see if there isn't something else on the screen I can share with you. Ah, we'll close that one. We're going to do, here we go. You tell me if you can see, can you see this new image on the screen? Yes. A jacuzzi, a jacuzzi image? Yeah, we can Let's see it. Yeah. Okay. Um, when I described how I was working now, I'm having great joy working as part of a, a network. And in this case, it was uh, working with good, really good typographers who could delight and surprise. And in this case, it's Jackson Cavanaugh out of Chicago, uh, his OK Type. I think that's the name of his studio, whatever, the Foundry. And uh, Eric von Blochlin and his uh, Foundry in The Hague is called Letterer. 
But um, this was a, a, I thought, a pretty sweet image to express jacuzzi well into the future because we did this book. This is part of my consulting book, right? There it is. This is a kind of management tool on a new brand. Uh, it's not the guideline document. It's, it's an attitude book, right? Like, what do you feel like? What's the strut that you're going to have? And you can see the covers and an AI cover that Muhammad and I worked on. And it shows in here, it shows posters and stuff that are analog and, and, and photographic. And it shows websites and catalog pages that we've put into action. And again, I just, I don't have to do anything. I just have to talk about it. This is not an AI piece, but this is actually from the industrial designers out of London made a Barbie pool, which is kind of cute. Okay, so that's that. Let's see what else we have here on the home screen. Okay, gotta close that. Ah, every year I do a Valentine's Day card for a friend of mine, Jessica Lagrange Interiors. And here's the card right here. It has a letterpress wrap to it. And as we zoom in close to it, it says, I don't know whether you can see that, it says hot, hot. And the insert cards are gold hearts. There's only one card per, or one insert per card, but every one is different. So it's that kind of thing. And the other layout was do them in red. This looks a little gross, right? Like a bad night at Jackson Pollock's studio. The binge. Okay. So that's, I think, all I want to share. You saw the emojis. Here they are big. Let's just do a quick run through on the emojis that you saw in faculty. And again, just to underscore the craziness of this software platform. Let me see if I can enlarge this window. Here we go. It's nice and clean. They are just juicy, weird things. All of a sudden it decided it wanted to do seven deep. It's like, okay. Because I had not had the spacing properly on the aspect ratio. So it does have a mind of its own. And right, it's supposed to have four across. We want five across. But look at some of those faces. Oh, my God. So this is what's happening to your emojis in the future. They will go into these little sealed, hermetically sealed bento boxes somewhere. And that's what's delighting me of late. However, I thought I would walk you now. I'll close that one. Oh, and the portfolio that you didn't see. Now we're going to go into the portfolio moment. Here we go. Let's just blow this up. Can you see that big thing here? NFL season has just ended, but there was a time not too long ago, if you can follow my cursor up to the word Giants in quarter one, the Giants were not in this year's playoffs, nor were the Jets. But that typeface right there uh, came out of an early contribution to an identity program back when I thought it was a good idea that everything on a printed piece of paper that came from the Thirst Studio was created by us. We would write the text, create the image. We would actually design the typeface. What a non-profitable idea. <laughs> so it'd be like, kids, don't do that. Don't do that, it's a waste. But today we can, uh, we can see those numbers uh, still on the referee jerseys. Okay, and this was uh, talked about in uh, that last podcast I did with Christian, and you can see here just down the street on the south side of Michigan, on the east side of Michigan Avenue, south of the Art Institute, there's this Metra train staircase, and for the longest time it may still be there. There's an image that I did in the studio with Balzan Lee, and she's now I think in Seattle. And this is old analog work. 
I had such a great time doing this piece of type. This was for Keenan Irie Waynes. And I remember Barb and I went out to Los Angeles to the Paramount Studios. And I got to go behind the curtain and make the presentation while he was bench pressing. And I'm holding the layouts over his face like this. And as he was lifting the weights, go, no, no, no. And it'd be another one. No, no. So I think this was one of the runners up, but uh, it actually never was used. It just inspired what they did use. I'd been working with uh, a delightful person, Holly Hunt, for decades. And why I thought this was like worth showing, it's one of those things that nobody ever sees. And I just loved it. It was for the Poetry Foundation for a prize called the Pegasus Prize. And there was the cover sheet. These were 12 inch square pieces of paper in an album sleeve that Barb had tracked down for us. And uh, this particular poet, Nathaniel uh, Mackey, also loved Sun Ra and some of those early uh, vinyls. And so that work was done in that spirit. But I wanted really to focus on this. And I wanted just to uh, allow me to turn on the lights of this studio and go around to this open door right here and show you something, but I'm changing the topic to Gilbert Paper. And Gilbert Paper doesn't exist anymore, but it was a client of Thirst for 17 years. And the privilege of being able to work with one client, four presidents, four marketing people for 17 years, is just mind blowing to me, right? And to have your audience be your colleagues, the graphic design profession. It was at a time when, when it was true that if a paper caught your attention and the promo that announced that paper delivered with it something that you could be inspired by, the only way a designer could say thank you, because they would obviously fall in love with the color or the texture, the only way they could say thank you was to specify that paper. Now, there were lots of mills, whether they were on the East Coast or whether they were in Wisconsin, making paper. Some of them are still out there. The French mill, the Nina mill, the Mohawk mill, right? They're all out there. But that industry has so consolidated. And since print has become crazy, I mean, we've even watched what's happened to the Pantone Library and in design, the use of that kind of promotion as a tool within to foster discourse in the community has disappeared. And so it's been replaced by Instagram or Pinterest or before that Behance or MySpace or whatever the tools were that allowed designers to share their work. It allowed ideas to percolate. And this particular moment in time was when there were papers that didn't know how to receive and sustain the messaging once they had been through a laser printer. Now today we find that unfathomable, right? But there was a time you'd run a piece of paper through, push print, run it through the laser printer and it looked beautiful until you touched it. And all that black powder would smear and you'd fold the thing up, stick it in your number 10 envelope. By the time it got to whoever was receiving it, it was a mess. So Gilbert had invented a new surface that received the paper. And we thought that the audience out there that was most inclined to be an early adopter of a paper designed just for the laser printer were the people who were in the early adoption world of reading Wired magazine. So we ran this poster. It folded out four panels large, and there it is. But what's so interesting about this poster is while it is a image that could be rendered tomorrow in mid-journey, it was a good two weeks of production. My brother was the photographer. We had a hairstylist. We ha had myself and Patrick King uh, doing the 3D work around the neck in a program called Ray Dream 1.0. This piece of uh, contour line drawing type that says Gilbert at the top, I drew that in, I think a program was called Freehand and it was designed in the manner of Paul Rand's ink drawings of typography when he was doing uh, cigar type 
right, for or whatever he was doing with that contour line drawing. In the drawer that this woman's eyes are being pulled out, there's a, yet another piece of paper. And on that piece of paper is a hand that's holding or that above it hovers a curl of Gilbert paper with a uh, Japanese-like screen of wave or tsunami. And so we're announcing that the tsunami's coming, right? The, the digital revolution is coming in this Alice in Wonderland with her rough of keyholes, right? You can just see the keyholes, everyone a portal to somewhere else. And each of those keyholes oh, had to be individually retouched because the artifact on them was so jaggy. So jaggy, but I remember drawing those selection masks and you know, smearing in at the bottom in a in a button which says print this moment. That's a typeface that Barry Deck designed for us. And Barry Deck had just come out of CalArts and he had designed a couple of interesting typefaces. This was a uh, commission I asked him to do. And it was like, design a typeface and the name should be Cyberotica. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's a good name. I think this is its only use, but nonetheless, I wanted you to see that and I want to turn the light on and I want to then share a couple of things uh, if you don't have any questions, I'll just turn the light on. Hey, Rick, I have a comment. I, I think I remember this poster. I think I used to have it. Um, so you just dated you. yourself, Michael. I yeah, know. I, I know. I know. But, but it, I do celebrate your work that, that it, I mean, years later, it does. It, I do. Rem I do seem to remember this. So, you know, it's. it's cool. I was watching a PBS show shortly after, maybe a, 10 years or so after. And uh, it was featuring some tech jockeys at MIT. And in the room, just like we all have something behind us, this poster was on the wall. And they went, oh, my God, that's success, right? So you had it, Michael. You remember it. That person had it. And over here, I'm going to pull out a couple of things. I'm going to pull out the very first project that was produced for Gilbert with our talent. And I will, uh, before I do this here, I, I just want to show you, it was introducing a new paper that they have now in the Nina line called ESSA paper. And this is, uh, you know, it's a big book. It has all kinds of stuff in it. Early Bronzo, in fact, this is what the Bronzo typeface was designed for, was for this book. And there's maybe a few of these out there. I've seen them once on eBay for $150. I have a few of them shrink wrap. But the story I want to tell is that when we received the opportunity to submit our portfolio, this was in 1988, I believe. And the port this project actually introduced in 1989. There were three of us essentially in the studio that belonged to Thirst. Barb's one of them. Uh, guy named Michael Jamanko, who was at April Griman studio and uh, moved back to Chicago where he grew up, myself. And we had a, a few others that were sort of joining the ranks. Uh, Tony Clausen would come in from Indiana. He was a luthier, but he was really crack at making things. And what do you do with that talent? Well, I think that talent that's hyper creative doesn't want to, at least I didn't want to, abuse it right so it was not going to be sold out so i remember the meeting we had put together a box of stuff in response to the the portfolio and or the call for a portfolio and sure enough we get called back on the short list of five and they say we're going to be in chicago and we'd like all five contestants if you will to show up and present to the marketing board it's like, wow. So that day came faster than I expected. And when it did come, I remember in the studio that morning, I bought a newspaper and I brought it in. And there were, we were sharing the studio with folks who were also in the same room, but they really weren't part of Thirst. And I asked them to hold the newspaper, knowing that it was today's headline. And I took an SX-70 picture. I stuck them in an envelope and I went around the, the room and I put other paper promotions in a cardboard box and in that cardboard box I put a waste basket of ours and I filled it up with paper promos and I went to the meeting and oh my god it was a long conference table you know like secession style conference table 
And I'm the last person presenting that day. Four others have gone before. And in my nervousness, I stood up. They said, would you like to introduce yourself? I said, I would. And I did a little verbal. If you work with me, you'll be working with these people. I pass around the SX-70s. That's all very charming and homespun. And then I take the wastebasket and I launch back and I and I, <laughs> I unload this, all the paper promos from it on the table and they go mm, all the way down the table and they stop just before they hit the CEO, who's a 37 year old woman. She was the youngest woman, youngest person ever to be the CEO of a Mead paper division. Her name was Pat Robinson. I went, oh my God, I could have like really, <laughs> really been in trouble had all those promos landed on her lap. But nonetheless, um, I make the presentation and I close by saying, if you want uh, my little studio to work on anything that mirrors that kind of promotion, that communication to designers, you have four other people to pick from. And with that, I went around, I picked up all the promos, put them in the box, got a taxi home or back to the studio and no sooner get back and the phone rings and <clears throat> I go, oh, my God, they're coming over. They said, we've been talking about your presentation. We want to see if you're for real. And I remember holding the phone and saying, holy shit, they're coming. Clean up. And a few minutes later, they all arrived and uh, we scored the gig. But the the punchline to this is. I promised them that what you would see in this first promo would mirror the recycled content you would have in the paper. If you were recycling old paper at 40 or 50% in the pulp, I would recycle our existing work 40 or 50% and then the other balance would be brand new, site specific. So a few weeks go by and Michael and I are so excited that we have completely uh, lost sight of that promise. And we get a flight to Wisconsin, Appleton, Wisconsin. We get picked up at the airport by Shirley Jean Frick, who was the marketing director at the time. And she takes us in to see Pat and we show her the layouts. And Pat is, you know, that face that your parents might've given you that said, I'm really disappointed in you. <laughs> it was like, oh my God. And she said, you didn't do at all what you promised you were going to do. This looks like everybody else's promotion. In fact, at that point, I was so proud to be using Massimo Vignelli's cut of Bodoni. What was I thinking? That was like, so not me. I was not the American modernist. Thirst was not the American modern studio. We didn't know how to do that. She gave it back and she said, I'll give you one more opportunity, but it can't take more than two weeks. And so like two dogs with our tails between our legs, Michael and I leave and we go back to Chicago and, say, and on the way we're determining what are we gonna do? Well, at that point, we crafted a methodology that later I termed extreme design. If we're Sean Bodoni, we're gonna make a typeface, right? We're gonna do just the opposite. If we're talking about a promotion that has saddle stitching or perfect binding, we're gonna go spiral bound. If we're talking about a promo that we have to go to one printer, we're gonna talk about a promo that has every page printed by a different printer across the country and we'll maximize their press sales staff. Like it's the Pro Bowl of printing. It, we had 29 printers <laughs> print this book. The production was a nightmare, but we got so many cool things happening on it, right? We got a page that looks like this. Oh, let me zoom in, here it is. That page is a, a chair made out of wriggly gum. We had that chair in the studio for the longest time. I thought that was the coolest thing. Next to it is this Could little- you please stop sharing your screen so we can see the images larger? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh my God, there I was holding it up. I was so happy. Can That's you see better. me? Thanks. Is that better? Oh my God, mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. Here we go. The whole thing was being told and you were looking at that one image all that time. Thank you for interrupting. So here's the book. This is the book, lots of uh, individual pieces of paper, some of them die cut, all of them printed, 29 different printers, some of them foil stamped. 
All right. Can you turn it to the camera? Yeah. Thank you. There we go. Right, we're putting a message like this in a paper promo, AIDS should die. So you know exactly what decade that was. We're showing a tip on here because they had writing paper and then we drift into a, a kind of weird picture that we made in the studio. Blue hair before it was fashionable, right? Embossing of the text paper. And now I want to get to the, the uh, here it is. Sorry, Rick, was there a brief or were, did they just say, do what you want, go crazy? It was never go crazy. It was be completely responsible. Show the performance of this paper. And along the way, inspire designers to return to creativity, right? So what does that look like? Well, the only way to make it look like anything is to just practice it yourself. And that's essentially what, what uh, Michael and I led in that process. Right, and so in our own studio at the time was this Wrigley chair. And, you know, there was this sketch that ended up being rendered by um, myself and Tony. All right, what do we have underneath it here? It's tipped on. Does it say anything? No, it says nothing. Okay, can you, pretty, sorry, Rick, can you talk about the process for how you came up with these ideas? Did you all just sort of gather and, and do some sketches or or what was what was your approach? Was there a big concept, a big idea behind it, or was it just totally free form? Uh, it was very free form. Uh, and I'm going to go to the other room for a second, but you can see here is this image. Okay, so now I'm going to take my phone and I'm going to take it to the other room. Okay, because you're asking a really good question. First of all, can you see when I move this phone? Is the phone moving? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, good. So there's other things I, I would have loved to show you. Maybe we'll come back in here, but I want to go in this room. Look, at, I've opened up all these flat files for you. In answer to your question, how do we get to the Wrigley chair page? We get to the Wrigley chair page because as I said, 40 or 50% of the project was going to be stuff that already existed. So I don't know whether you can see that painting, that little painting on a piece of wood, that little gouache painting. Can you see that? It's a little off center. It's a little off center. There you go. Okay. So I made this thing because I was a fan of the Wrigley Company. And I love that package. That package. And I also made one that you can see through the plastic here, it looked a bit like a, a Pete Mondrian boogie woogie piece, or it looked like this, or it looked like that. I mean, I have lots of these, you can see, I'm not even taking them out of the plastic. And I thought, oh, this will be really good. We're gonna make a chair out of this. And we had built the chair. Then it was time to make a page layout with it. Right, here's the tsunami for Gilbert. There's the tsunami artwork. You can see that. So no, there was not a big, a big um, brainstorm session. It was go through our own files and let's cobble together what we already have and see if we can put it in some form of appropriateness relative to the colors of the paper that existed because there were so many different colors and so many different there were two different textures for each of the colors so that's essentially what it was but for gilbert it was a, a luxurious uh client opportunity where i could lead the way with whatever i was doing on the side and you can see i do like lots of stuff on the side i do like photography on the side and I do airbrush work and whatever. And I think that stuff that's happening on the side, and here we go. And this was a retrofit of the Tannhäuser poster for the Lyric Opera. So, I, so we took this picture that Michael and I had done of the lead tenor, took it out of the poster context and put it into the ESSA book. And let's see where it looks, what it looks like here.
Yeah. Rick, I have a funny question, but with, with such sort of highbrow and ethereal and artistic work, how did you tend to get sign off from clients or did you ever feel restrained by, you know, sort of more general expectations? It just seems like all of this work is so far outside of the norm of a lot of what we see nowadays. Uh, this was three decades ago. So the nowadays does not apply. <laughs> it does. Okay. Though, but still. It, yes. I, I want to take you back in here and answer your question with this book here. Okay. So let me just see if I can get back to my desktop. There was a time in the world of thirst. And let me just get it here so I can see it. Maybe I should hold on. I'm going to open up my screen so I can see the zoom and I'll see what you see here on the screen. And then I'll know how to direct it. Okay. So here we go. That's not bourbon or whiskey. That's tea. Okay. So whatever this, you say, whatever you say, right. So <laughs> this particular document is uh, a real estate book. And it was for this client, Bill Smith at Smithfield properties. Bill's no longer with us nor is his company, but in the area just south of North Avenue, where the Apple store is, there's a street called Blackhawk, which is where our studio used to be. And Bill was gonna build this building. Now, most real estate brochures have a kind of look and feel to them, right? But this brochure uh, indicated how I was able to get sign off. And the way I believe I was able to get sign off on things was I wasn't working with the middle managers per se, I preferred to work with the entrepreneurs who own the business. And I preferred to have, even if they were difficult, a relationship with them. The downside was that relationship would always bottleneck in the studio because not everything happened with just me, right? You couldn't do a lot of work. You couldn't say yes to a lot of projects because the implementation of those projects required the assistance of your team, right? South of North and a block west of Halstead on Blackhawk. That was it, that's what we wanted them to know. So you know, this is Lincoln Park. Well, it wasn't Lincoln Park, but you can see there's no real estate hype on this page. There's no blah, blah, blah text, right? A Southern, Northern, Western and Eastern view where you can totally see the skyline and lake. So you get it. Everyone needs you to be a sentence that you can do sono, right? Some notables, whatever, observers. Here's what I want to get to. We were running out of good ideas, so we just like had dinner one night and wrote it down on, of course, napkins. So now is your opportunity to live sono. It's so not vanilla. I thought, oh, well, that is about the funniest thing ever. And then we went into the normal stuff. Here's your floor plans. Right. So once you satisfy this, the overture of design and, and conversation can be as creative and uh, beautifully produced on this really wacky paper. I think this was the Eames canvas paper. So we did open end binding on it. We put these gray Bible uh, uh, page turners here. World class architecture just south of North Avenue. All right. That's nice type. So no, the 21st century condo presence. In Chicago's Lincoln Park, it really wasn't Lincoln Park, but we stretched there's, it a bit. There's also there's no photos. <laughs> I mean, there's no, nothing, right? There's no like, here's your kitchen and here's your here's your parking area. It was just this model. That's all we had. And at the back, what did we do? Oh, we did do a sales center, and so we had the sales center photographed, right? But that's any condo picture right there, and that's on the back cover. So you have the tower units and the tower lofts. That was it. I think the way good design happened, whether it was for Gilbert or whether it was for Bill Smith or whether it was even for the Chicago Board of Trade in the trilogy of annual reports that we did after VSA did their amazing three uh, annuals was to have a really kick-ass relationship with the client. The client who could make the decision on the spot right? That's what really made it good. Otherwise, you were just doing design. 
Okay, let's see what else we got here. I'm taking any question you want. I have a question. You you yeah. you you're exploring this mid journey uh, now, which is which is great. But um, do you do you, like a lot of your work was very hands, you know, hand done, um, and and perhaps more challenging. Do you, I guess I I mean I guess I'm answering my own question. Are you are you excited by the idea of it being less tedious and less, um, you know, hands on, or 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 do you do you, do you celebrate that aspect? Is it easier that way? Do you prefer it that way? Or, you know, I, I guess the reason I ask is I, I, I took I, I took a class with Martin Vineski, who mm -hmm. and, and, yeah, I used, I used to and, and he's an amazing designer in West Coast. Amazing. Yeah. But, but he would talk about the 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 um the discoveries in in making the process more difficult. And he that's something he actually took pleasure in is is making it more challenging and more hands-on and more difficult. Um can you talk about how how I mean, I guess do you do you enjoy the liberating aspect of mid-journey and how it it frees you to do whatever you want without these more challenging aspects? I find it incredibly challenging. And to date, Midjourney keeps a record, as I mentioned, of how many illustrations or prompts that I've sent them. I've sent them over 2,500 of these things. And I'm always being like this, the best art director I can be. Uh, so that's kind of a working process. But at the same time, I love the making, right? I love whether it's ink drawings there they are or this episode from a hamilton type workshop or those photographs on the wall right or collage work which i'm like a a fiend for right i love that so i don't want that to disappear but by the same token um I should answer the question more specifically. The reason I don't want it to disappear is because it's in that slow process of making that you're thinking. And for me, I'm always asking myself the next round of questions. Oops, sorry. Hand on the screen. You know, like, what if I did this? What if it turned sideways? What if it was a different color? And and I discoveries do. discoveries you make from like making mistakes and uh, along the way where uh, where oh know, yeah and, and it's actually not a mistake it's a discovery <laughs> yeah it is um, yeah the those things you know you've heard them called happy accidents they are delightful accidents right I love those moments where it's it's different. And sometimes my making is uh, different, uh, changes all the time. So I'm gonna give you an example here. I'll go back to this, I'll put it on the chair so I can see it. I'll do this one first. You know, the, the most making I did was when I converted my apartment overlooking the city, I was in that Mies building up on Diversity Street into a very messy Sumi Inc. studio where in the course of nine months, I did 575 notes to self, as I called them, right? Using the Sumi Inc. in a vertical position and the happy accidents or the mistakes were the fact that I was collaborating with gravity. Oh, let me turn it this way for you. There we go. And so we turn these into a book. But I was trying to make sense of things. And this uh, holistic doctor that I had went to visit, she told me, she said, do you journal? And I said, well, kind of. And I pulled out my little Moleskina book and showed her what I was journaling with. And she said, mm, that's not the kind of journaling I'm thinking about. It's not taking notes in meetings. It's the kind of stuff that you're thinking about during the course of the day and the spaces in between, you should take those home with you and you should write them down. And so I decided to write them down on big pieces of paper and uh, collected these 
these things. And during the time doing it, I learned a lot about my patience for work, my ability to take a notation that I may have put on a little note card during the course of the day and bring it home and chase it with gravity. I was only using a turkey baster and a foam brush. So that was my medium. Is this right? book available anywhere, Rick? On um, Blurb, yeah. Let go. Look at that one. Is that upside down for you guys? It is upside down. How the fuck? Turn the phone upside down. Oh, that's in me. Let's try this. No. Phone is the screen. There we go. No. Turn it this way. I guess it's supposed to be vertical. I don't know why. But in any case, you get the idea here. I'd be more than happy to turn you on to the link. Yeah, that would be great. And I would love to, to spend time with this book. I, it looks amazing. Yeah, the Newberry Library, uh, they wanted every one of them. It's like, what? You want 575 drawings? I've kept a couple. I can show you. You see that one? But I just love how dense the black is. And all of this done with a turkey baster very quickly, right? You can just feel the spontaneity in it. But it's this moment where you're chasing with the gravity. And then all of a sudden, you can feel that the paper across the floor has been curled up. And that's an accident. But in the curl, it also allowed me to sort of pick up this corner. And you can just feel that ink going, whoop, make a right hand turn. We're going down this way. Right, and this is when you draw with a, a turkey baster. Right, I I love those mistakes, but sometimes you know it starts with an examination of self, just collages out of the newspaper, of type, sketches, little note card sketches, and then. A poster and there's the huge height and there's the work so it's like a self-portrait poster for a lecture that was done in vancouver a long time ago and here was this oh five under the tree of happiness and love it's hard to talk about the work but i will tell you in answer to your question about somebody not liking your work or dismissing it. I'm gonna take this into another room here. And again, this is an old school story, but it, it sort of reminds me of why I didn't work for agencies. I didn't think that was healthy, at least for my creative process. I had been contacted by the foot cone and belding agency in San Francisco. They had seen the collages on the back of that emigre magazine where I was making the ease. Let me just go back here to this room and show you. There's the magazine. Those are the ease. Okay, so they see this. And they want me to do tags for their jeans in the store. And they want them to say the name of the gene. Right? Like straight, what's this say? Straight something row. I can't even read it. This one here, hip hugger. So I just sort of set out to make these collages. And I was so happy with them. Baggy shorts. Ballpoint pen and newspaper. I can't read that one anymore. In any case, I put them together. I sent them to San Francisco. They were very excited. Here's, here's the book of the collages themselves. So I'll see if I can flip through this. Guys fit is what that says. 
super wide, loose. And their idea was that they were going to take these collages, put them on the hang tags, workwear, like the flare. So I was an illustrator here, not really a uh, an ad person. Shorts. And they were going to project them on the wall, and the famous photographer Albert Watson in New York was going to put the models wearing that particular clothing underneath. Right? These are kind of fabulous, tribal looking. All right, there they are. That's a pretty awesome collaboration. But I want to put it in the context of time and decade. You know, straight legs. I go out to San Francisco to see them. Oh, let me get myself on the frame. There we go. I go to San Francisco to see these things. I'm ushered into their building down by the wharf. I get up to the floor and the art director at the time, and I think the art director was Brian Collins, the Brian Collins. And he pulls me aside and he goes, hey, Rick, before we go into the showroom, I want you to know that uh, some things have happened since you sent the layouts. I've made a presentation to the Levi people and uh, they asked me, who is this person who you commissioned? And I told them it was you and they said, is he famous? And Brian said, yes, he's famous within the design circle for sure. They said, we never heard of him. And Brian said, well, who do you think is famous in the design circle? And they said, David Carson. Get David Carson to do these. Now, I'm hearing this as we're from the elevator walking to the showroom. <laughs> I'm saying to myself, I'm never going to work with an agency again. And uh, we get there and he said, what you're going to see is that I sent David your collages and he redid them and Albert shot them. And that's what you're going to see in the showroom. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. So um, yeah, that happened, but on a more corporate level, because so much design is done at the corporate level and you can see it. Well, you could have seen it on the 3st.com site where a lot of the work as the studio and I matured, the decision to sort of like grow careers for people who had been there a long time demanded that the projects were less idiosyncratic and less Rick focused. And in doing so, systems and proper ways of managing a project became more important than the creativity around the project. And all the while trying to ensure that there was a creative spark that made that work at least worth doing. And I think that became the definition of thirst in its final iteration. It was a smart studio where the intelligence of implementation was really just uh, on fire, right? And it was a great trio, primarily, of myself, John Pobajewski, and Bud Rodeker, who were uh, young designers who stuck around, I think it was about 23 years collectively. And we rocked, right? At the end, we had Nick Adam join, and along the way, Anna Mort was there, and Zach Minnick, and right, designers who were out there in that iteration of thirst, um, learn to remain creative and at the same time remain responsible to the client's objectives and all the things we care about. And that's why in this book here, the key words that are shown, like meaningful, essential, relevant, new and real and meaningful, I think I said that one, those key words were the key value propositions that any product that came from Thirst did. It tried to subscribe to that. And we've tried to make certain we were working with people who also understood that. 
I don't know that I could survive in today's world as easily as I did then, uh, because I don't know how to ferret out those people. In fact, I don't even know whether they exist. I think they do exist because we see some phenomenal work coming on all levels of scale. But it, whatever, I think that was the important part to make certain that the right kind of folks were on the other side of the aisle, if you will. Did you uh, find yourself turning clients away a lot if they were trying to possess too much of that creative control or, or didn't understand your vision? I um, walked out of one meeting in my my career where I actually packed the layouts up right in the meeting, put them in my portfolio case and walked out. Uh, that happened one time. The answer to your question was, never did I turn anybody down after I had agreed to work with them. Because once you come in and you have conversation, there are some metrics for whether we want to work with you, or at least I wanted to work with them or not, and it had to do not only with the quality of the project, but who you were. Would I take you home? Would I enjoy having dinner with you? Right? Would you be like a valued collaborator? Or would you just be a client? I never wanted to be that designer who would go, ah, this project sucks. My client made me do this. And I would always think like, did the client put you in a hammerlock? What did they do to make you do whatever you were told to do. Why didn't you, right? And in this, uh, I have a consulting gig right now. A very interesting thing happened. It's totally off the record, but this guy on the other end of a Zoom call didn't care for a particular direction. I mean, it was really an, a bold step on how to handle a cover for a catalog. And rather than turning it into a conversation he built a survey monkey site and invited 35 people to take a survey of what we had done do you like it is it effective da, da, da. and nobody liked it in other words nobody was in the meeting nobody had any input into it people support what they help create so if they can't be in the meeting why do i give a shit about that and uh, I just had to say, really, you like didn't take advantage of the relationship that we've been fostering, you and your middle manager. I'm just your consultant here to observe the process. But this is a very awkward dynamic that's taking place here, especially among creative marketing people, that you would put your boss in an awkward position because you went and did a survey. So I'm still the consultant and the work wasn't rejected, but the conversation was had. And now the tendency is to return back to the core group and have real dialogue. Like, I don't like it is good dialogue. It's not working for me is good dialogue. Because then it begs the question, what do you think we should do? Or what if we did this? Right? And to work with this methodology of drawing pictures. There's, there's the truck. This was the last conversation we had. That was the truck I hold up, held up to the screen. It's like, yeah, that's how we can think. And they look at that and they go, oh yeah, I remember that sketch. I was in the meeting. And then when they see the final art, it's like, oh, they get it. So I hope I answered that question. That's a really difficult question for designers because we, at least I, uh, as a younger designer, had a difficult time sort of like building myself up enough that I could go toe to toe or go on the same plane with the person who had given the opportunity to do the work. And I tried always to sort of understand what their real agenda was. Are they on a quarterly review? Do they really care deeply about this project? Do they care about the creativity? Do they want their sales force to be happy, right? All of these dynamics that we experience, uh, they're the same today, just the platforms that we're working on may be a little bit different and the speed in which we're being creative is a little bit different, but the, the shared intent and the shared objectives and the shared agendas, they really need to be in place for anything good to happen. Rick and I, and I have one question. So, as you were as you 
were working through all this all this work who were your who were your mentors or like anytime you stumble into a situation where perhaps you didn't have an answer or didn't know how to respond like who was your like on your speed dial of like hey this is this is happening can you advise me um uh there were two kinds of uh, person, one who had been through it before and one who was in it with me. And the other, I guess the third one would be who it was being done for. So I'll just start with the, the one who'd been through it before. And I had um, the good fortune of being able to pick up the phone and call Bob Vogel. And Bob Vogel ran RVI and he was also um, the founder of VSA, but he was also my vice president when I was the STA president for two years. And then after me, he became the president of the STA, which he changed its name to the American Center for Design. But Bob understood the business of creativity, the dynamics that took place in the conference room. And at that time, I was dressing to be like Bob. I would wear the white shirt and the black thin tie, right? That was my way of saying, hey, may I join the conference table? This was like late 70s through the 80s. And that kind of designer position at the conference table was a new thing. There were senior people, the Jay Doblins of the world and the uh, John Massey's and the Massimo Vignelli's in town. Uh, they earned that place, the Hank Roberts, right? The Susan Jackson Keggs, Milton and Millie Goldshaw. They earned that already, but for the next generation, we didn't. And so Bob taught me a lot, not only about that dynamic, the subtleties of the dynamic and being like in a position to share the objectives of business, but also how to run a business, how to design a studio practice where it wasn't just watching your investment in staff and time go out the window. It was how do you maximize that and make a living for everybody. Uh, so that, that was the person I could talk to who had been through it before. The people who were uh, in it with me were the people who were still in it. And the I had two people that were go-to. One was uh, Dane Arnett, and the other was uh, a photographer named Tom Vack. And those two guys would come to it, Tom more disgruntled than me, and Dana more optimistic and playful, as he was nine years younger than I. Um, he was really good because he had the pulse of Bob, and I could get like Bob Vogel's second tier information through Dana. And I could see Dana delivering at the corporate level in a way that was making him completely happy and doing fabulous work. And it's like, well, I could do that too. So he, he encouraged me and I sort of morphed the practice so that we could be a small studio working for big clients, whether it was the Chicago Board of Trade then or at the end it would be whoever. I can't remember now who it was, but you know, people who had like real skin in their game. People who were building mega buildings or doing, uh, I know I helped Holly Hunt for 30 years until she sold her business for $95 million in cash to Noel. I mean, we knew that we were building a brand. That was important stuff, but it was a design brand for designers. So we weren't gonna lose sight of that fact that creativity was really fundamental, really fundamental. Mm -hmm. And the third uh, group was, as I said, it was like uh, the people who hadn't quite been through it yet. And that was the the people in the office, right? The studio, like, are you feeling as, uh, it was maybe even the clients more specifically. When I would work with the entrepreneurs, whether it was Holly or Bill Smith, or even a woman at the Lyric Opera for, God, I think, almost two decades. Her name was Susan Matheson. And every one of us had a sense of bravado, but a very uh, within reach vulnerability. And that vulnerability would encourage us to be completely honest. Like, do you think this is gonna work? Is this the best we can do? What if we tried this, right? Those kind of questions changed the dynamic of a meeting. Nobody was allowed to be Julius Caesar, right? It wasn't that at all. It was like, what are we gonna do? 
So I could learn about the business practice through Bob, and I could learn that I wasn't alone through Dana, but I could really learn to share the process with someone who was actually going to succeed because of that process. And so it allowed, well, it actually forced me to, to take the story back into the studio. The odd part was the entrepreneurs by their nature were not keen on patience, especially from you know, what they might refer to as staffers. And so they were quite often the trolls under the bridge. They'd blow into the studio and be completely disruptive. And people were saying, I don't ever want to work with that fucking asshole again. And it would be like, well, okay, we're going to see if we can uh, understand what their agenda is. And I will make certain that they understand what our position is, right? We can't meet that deadline or that is not the 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 right approach to whatever, you know, we can't throw that portion of the project away just because we can't afford it. We have to find another way to make it special. So those sorts of real world dynamics, I think ensured a long run of high creative work without selling too much of the soul. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I came across a self-portrait that I did and the self-portrait read something like this. I sold my soul a long time ago and I've been spending the last 20 years trying to buy it back. <laughs> right? So we all feel this way. Um, I just happened to write it down so I could revisit it. Actually, I revisited it earlier today. What was your experience like when you were um, a much younger designer and rather than executing your own ideas you were executing someone else's or you had less of a say oh okay great question i got started uh i did my graduate work in photography i come to chicago having only taken a letterpress class in graduate school to make the title pages for our photo portfolios when they were in a box and i took a handful of design classes as an undergraduate at Bowling Green State University. When I come to Chicago, I want to be a photographer, but I don't have any studio photography experience. I'm the sort of uh, dark room guy. I could print really well, but I wanted the artwork to be a little bit more creative and a little left of center. New processes were emerging, whether it was the fax machine and generative systems or the SX-70 camera. That's where I was. So I thought, okay, I'm going to be a designer. I cobble together a very lame portfolio. I get a job at an ad agency in the city in the Time Life building for six months doing production work for oddly recruitment ads. I quit after six months. I am unemployed for another few months and I take a gig that I answered in the Chicago Trib to replace a woman who was pregnant at an insurance company. And there I'm gonna be responsible for the dark room and I'm gonna be responsible for production of the newsletter and cafeteria flyers. And I do that for a year and a half when I encounter a sign on a flyer, on a telephone pole with a flyer. This is 1978 for an Icagrata Congress at Northwestern University. I get to go there and I meet Bruce Beck's wife and Bruce hires me as his assistant where I am inking his typographic work and I'm running his darkroom. I am the ninth employee for a guy who's 63 years old and he retires at 65, 66, I'm the last guy standing. And in that process, I am learning the process of design and I am listening carefully to Bruce, but I do remember at one time, I think like I've got the secret sauce. I'm the one who went down to see the writer type show on uh, postmodern design that had Weingart and April Griman and it was curated, I think, by Bill Bunnell. And I go back to Bruce and at one time he tells me to do something like, oh my God, Bruce, this is like so bad. It was probably a really fucking great idea. But me, Mr. Cocksure, I said, you got to search your creative soul. Now, I can't believe I said that to this maestro I can't believe it. He was so generous to me, but that was me sort of like my own wake up call to like, dude, you better pay attention. You better pay attention to the way things are, are done. So I was a pretty good guy who would just do what I was told. 
and make whatever contributions I could. At the end of Bruce's time, uh, I was that last employee and he went on his own and I had only two options, go on my own or go work for somebody else. So I got the opportunity to be, since I was the SDA president at the time, a guy in a room about this big with no windows. And uh, I set up my shop. And you learn at that point to navigate the space between being a suck up and a really good contributor. It took me in those first six years, six years to discover that there's a difference between being a vendor and a consultant. And I reiterated that story many, many times in the time with young designers at Thirst saying, you know what, we can be really good vendors. We can show up on time. We can have everything picture perfect. We go to every press check, never miss a deadline, always be on budget. But along the way, we better be a really good consultant. We better be the ones who deserve to be at the conference table, to be in the meeting, if you will. Because again, people support what they help create. And when that six years ended, that took me from 81 to about uh, 87, 88, it was time to close that studio. And because I went to every client, I said, do you see me as a vendor or a consultant? They said, oh, you're the preferred vendor. It's like, geez. I want to be the preferred consultant. So I left it and said, you know what? There has to be a new way. I need to start all over again. And that's when the thirst world happened. So so how did you how did you work with clients and get them to treat you less more as a consultant and less as a vendor? Was there a, a, a process that, that you adhered that you you developed that, that allowed that? Yeah. To <laughs> yes, it was a bit self-effacing, but occasionally I would make a joke. You know, I would I would do this with my my body and my pen. I would. I'm being told here what the state of the union is on now. Well, I don't know. I just wondering when you're going to. I'll come up in about five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, the dogs are hovering here in the studio. Okay, okay. they might want to stay here. Sorry, guys. We outside, but it's too early for them. Too early. Yep. I'll be up in a minute. So I would make this gesture like I was writing on a steno pad, and and I would go, "Would you like fries with that?" And that <laughs> that comment was really like, "Oh, you feel like you're being in a position to take orders," and that would be an icebreaker. And as an icebreaker, that would allow the dynamic to shift. And when you shift that dynamic in your favor, you begin to earn a friend. Also, if you satisfy all of their needs, they might actually allow you to satisfy your needs too. And your needs may be like, hey, I have a really cool idea for the, uh, I have a really cool idea for this photo or for this direct mail. And they've listened to you. Again, we're at a point, let me just show you here. Here's the world that we were in back then when I was cutting my groove. We were in the world of paper mock-ups for direct mail and brochures, right? Where the stuff was, it was bold and big, but all of the type was just like Xerox Greeking type that you would cut the columns, everything sort of looked crazy or you'd make another layout that would look like this oh, back it up you can see and when that kind of thing look how weird this is this is shabby why i kept this i think i kept it for this moment right now and when it's all done it for this gift store on well street it's no longer there it would look like this right oh and these are the inserts and this was the little door that popped out. So look. Oops. To me, that was a big idea. But when you're fondling this kind of thing, what happens in the analog world is someone says, what if we, how do we mail that? How do we give that away? Right? And those kinds of questions are the beginning of collaboration. The moment you can foster collaboration, it's all uphill. It's all uphill. Oh, yeah, here's the Chiazo president. And look, there's little, little initial caps, bold face. 
Ooh, they were like measles. I haven't seen this in a while. One color on a colored piece of paper. This is all very easy to do. You just stick it in the guillotine cutter and you just shear it at that angle. You know? But when they're all done and the copy's all written, you're allowed to do this. All right? Take the word up. Move it up. Stick an arrow on it. Well, that seems super simple today, but you get permission to do that, to kind of trick something out, and then you stick it in, and I think everything, oh yes, oh Rick, aren't you clever? Yes, hi there, Winnie, yeah. Everything sort of lines up with that little button right there. You get it right there, there's the button. I take this out. And that button gets foil stamped because you think that's super cool and you find a printer who's going to help you do that. Jeff Barnes, who was the design director at Container Corporation at the time, did this logo. So he cut the groove, but for whatever reason, he was not working with the client at the time. So this was my first project with them to sort of like take what Jeff was doing and make it happen. But right here, this I thought was super cool. I didn't want to have something that glued and at that point, the client is fine with it, right? This little triangle here gets put in that little slit. Well, they have to do that. This particular assembly was super easy for them. And I think what I'm trying to say is you just build a friend, right? You just build a friend who can be your collaborator, and you can be their collaborator, and everyone's a winner. And Rick, I have I have one other question. When when you were doing a lot of this work, how'd you like how'd you find the discipline or what was your routine or how how did you manage to to be able to produce so much work and to just all constantly be having fresh ideas? Like did you have any just I'm I'm just curious about like what were you doing? Like what when when were you waking up? When were you going to sleep? <laughs> that's a good question you see these eyes here actually tonight's conversation with all of you has made me so nervous i woke up at four in the morning and didn't go back to bed that's why i look like a raccoon today or tonight um but i found myself both as a, a dad and studio head and consultant uh, waking up early and trying to remain as creative as I possibly could mm -hmm. all the time. You know, much to the chagrin of uh, my responsibilities as a dad, it wasn't always great, but I really did try to be there for the kids and, you know, make certain I was there for the soccer game. And even if I showed up on a vacation at the airport, racing to the terminal while they're all there, ready to go to Hawaii. Um, yeah, there was a, a lot Christian, I was probably packing too much in. And I'll give you a personal story. My father died when he was 45. And I got in practice um, in 1981. I think I was, in fact, I know I was. I was born in 51. I was 30 years old. And at that point, I thought, I've got 15 more years left. And by, by saying that to myself, I put myself in a kind of weird... Um, I don't know, some weird space capsule that was going really fast. I was trying to like pack in a lot of life in 15 years. And when I turned 45, I went, oh shit, I'm still alive. I thought, well, I could slow down, but by then I was kind of conditioned. And so I liked being creative. I liked, as I said, making certain that there was work happening that wasn't necessarily client inspired but it was personally inspired that I could share it with my clients. And it pre-qualified who knocked on the door, right? And as the thirst world matured, the kinds of folks who came knew of the past, but also wanted to make certain that they could get some of that creativity, some of what I would like to maybe say was brilliance or smarts, and they could also get some really solid uh, performance as it related to implementation. So I think you have to have all of those things, but you got to start with a really sound relationship. Mm -hmm. 
And that relationship is, you know what, I didn't get it right last time, but since we are friends, you know I'm going to get it right the next time. And that goes back to that first episode with the Gilbert Paper president. You know, you guys disappointed me. I remember the first time I did the work for Julie Wright, who was Richard Wright's partner at the Wright Auction House. And she had gone out of her way to see that I had the opportunity to do her identity. And when I shared it with her, her comment was, the first time I shared something, she says, I'm disappointed. Oh my God, disappointed is the absolute worst critique I ever received, right? Especially from somebody whose vision I completely admired and trusted. I'm disappointed. Oh, am I fired? I haven't even got started. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I know we're almost at, at the two hour mark and Oh my god, sorry guys. <laughs> your dog is, is ready to She's ready. She you can hear her. Winnie the poodle. Um but does anyone anyone else have any other questions for Rick? I, I have one. <laughs> I appreciate your candor. It's it's very interesting. Um how was it to work? You you worked with emigre as well, right? Like Rudy Vandalins. How did, did how did they how did that process wise? Sorry to focus on process, but but how did that work with them? Did they just give you free form to do what you, you wanted to, or or did they give you direction or how did that work? We're at the beginning of the digital revolution. Designers are moving away from glue pots and T squares and into the world of a laser print and something on the screen. And Rudy is, he and Susanna are leading the charge on crafting their own typefaces. And Rudy, as the outsider, is gonna do exactly what Christian did, make a publication that documented that moment in time. So he calls people that he knows. We're all the same age. He calls people that he knows, whether it's Jeff Keaty or Andrew Blauvelt or Lorraine Wilde or myself or right, Ed Phillip. The list just kept going. And if he called me, I'd say, oh, you should talk to this person. You should talk to that person. And pretty soon, Rudy had formed a really good network. And his brilliance, brilliance was to set the tone, set the, the kind of theme and the attitude and allow everybody to do their thing and put in the bottle that moment in time that was lightning in a bottle. And this first issue of faculty is going to have some resonance right now, but boy, is it going to have some resonance five years from now? Because Christian didn't put any stipulation other than one word in front of everybody, which was the word Genesis. It's like, oh, that's so familiar to me. That's how Rudy would play, right? When Rudy did issue number 69, which was the rant issue, he said, Rick, you probably have something to say. Why don't you uh, do an article? Because it was all text then. And I remember doing the rant article. And I remember waking up very early in the morning, went into my Quirk <laughs> Express <laughs> and started typing as I was thinking. And it's very free form. I sent it to him. He goes, great, we're going to print it. He typeset it. I wrote it. When he was asking to do illustrations, Rick, would you like to do the cover this time? Or Rick, you know, uh, I had David Carson scheduled to be the interview this month, but he bailed on me at the last minute. Can you take his place? I said, pick up the phone and call me. Let's have a chat. That's kind of how it worked then. And my guess is it's pretty much how Christian fostered this, right? People who were in the club participated. They sent their work, whether it was Alyssa or whether it was Patrick or whether it was Los, right? Everybody just sort of sent their things. And there's so many cool things in here. I want to just like sit down and read this publication. It only arrived a few hours ago. Yeah, I want to see what is the verve in Chicago right now. What's the next generation of designer pondering? Right? Not dealing with what are they pondering? What are they trying to make sense of? Because my guess is a lot of it is what we were trying to make sense of. And a lot of it is, you know, influenced by things that are brand new. 
Did I answer that question okay? Yes, just fine. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, You're welcome. And then Rick, Rick, one last thing. The last time that that we video chatted, you you opened up your closet and you had like the shrine in there. Ah, would you like to see the shrine? Here we go. Yes. Here we go. I almost a put a sign on the door that said "open." So <laughs> oh, let's see. I'm gonna get this one. Because it was looking at the... it, it was included in the photographs that you sent of your studio space. So ah uh, yes yes. <clears throat> so we all know Matthew Hoffman. In fact, when he was the artist in residence at Thirst for a year, uh, he did lots of projects with us, which were so good. But one of them was this typeface that uh, he, myself, and Dowson Lee crafted, which allowed us to do some things. And shortly after that, um, you know, Matthew would invite different people to. Here we go. To like submit something that was related to you are beautiful. So on one of his big shows, I did this banner. And this banner is the little frog, a little digital frog. And he's in the water and he's waiting for the princess to come by, who he's saying, you are beautiful. And he's hoping that she looks down at his blue eyes and says, you are beautiful, Mr. Frog, and gives him a kiss and he turns back into a prince. So. <laughs> I wanted this to be my Zoom backdrop. And it's also on a table that uh, my friend Jonathan Neshi made. He sells this on First Dibs. It's called Rick's Table. And there's my wife, Diane. And, you know, a shelf of books, the new Pentagram book, an old Rouchet book, the new Sagmeister. So many of these I don't even open. I just love them. A Cody Hudson it's a little sculpture of a skull. All right, another pile of books. Here's the, my favorite book here. This is by Stephen Farrell. I can't do it with one hand. It'll all come tumbling down, but it's his Voss book. If anybody can get their hand on that baby, that's really we incredible. actually um we we I just picked up a copy of it that's arriving tomorrow, and I'm thinking it's going to be our book or design book club book. Um, oh yeah, it's a masterpiece. Yeah. Totally a masterpiece. It is. Uh, the slowness of design and typography. It's so mannered and fondled and lovingly and brilliantly put together. I just love that book. Love that book. But there's some old ones in here, right? There's even Massey's book down there. I have two copies, a Rand book, uh, a Maholi Naj book from the show. Yes, here's Emma Gray stuff. Even on my desk right now, there's an Emma Gray flyer that came it's over there look at how messy this room is <laughs> it's funny yeah so that's my little uh crazy shrine you were beautiful would not have happened had it not been for matthew there it is all clipped up there on the ceiling yeah yeah cool well Yes, and, and one last thing here. You see this big Bible of a book? Yeah. Right? It's called Time. And uh, as I was preparing to leave the studio, Thirst, I was nervous, very nervous. I didn't know what the future was going to hold. And uh, I discovered I was opening my phone incessantly. All right? And what I just started to do when I would do it, occasionally I'd like open my phone and it would be two, two, two. Or I'd open my phone, it would be one, two, one, three. And if you add all those numbers up, I think it turns into seven. It was August 7th. Right? So I screen grabbed these things, started screen grabbing, and then I put them all in a book. <laughs> it's just called time. And it's as obsessive as, as making those little things, but it's, right? I would put a little piece of type here at the bottom in red. That was my parse. What's it say? Perfect timing. 333, May 26. Six divided by two is three. I don't know. It seemed to all make sense at the time. 
so it took me out of my uh i don't know my little funk right just to start screen grabbing the phone and to discover that i could turn my nervous energy my little dependency on that phone pulling it out of my pocket not even wanting to check email into this brick of time is there going to be a volume? will there be a volume two <laughs> <laughs> no i hope i'm never in that state again that was a unnerving place to be that was very very weird to be in that state so i only have a couple of them there they are this is the third copy right there yeah i i mean i could do this wherever you guys have been a really attentive and uh uh, appreciative group i'm grateful grateful thank you for letting me share and i'll just put this up here i'll get my finger out of the way here put this up rack so i can see you oh there we go boom well, thank you for spending this much time with me yeah thank you so much rick this was great and and are you visiting Chicago anytime soon? It would be I'm great. living there all next uh, fall, starting in September, mid September to the end of the year. Okay. And um, so I'll be back there with Diane, and then uh, I'll be gone in the summer. We're going to go to Nova Scotia for the summer, and that's just a few months away. Well, so yeah, I'll be back in Chicago because I want to like uh, reconnect physically with people Did you know to get together and to do a little dinner or something with the group and the oh yeah that would be that would be divine that'd be so good or just i'd like to hang out at one of your events that you do you know i don't want to be the speaker i want to just be a participant okay yeah i'm so happy that you let me in this book i know it was all just about chicago people but you made a case that i could be in the book <laughs> And why that? Why there's so much attention to Bronzo is just mind blowing to me. <laughs> I have to read that article. <laughs> That's very weird. Now you know where it came from and why it happened. It happened because we couldn't do corporate design because Pat Robinson thought we broke the promise to her to do something that was fresh and new. Mm -hmm. And I got nervous. There you go. I got nervous. All right. Well, thank you, Rick. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks, Rick. You're welcome. Thank you. Let's see if my sister's still here. No, she bailed on me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate this. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Christian, are you able to provide us with um, contact info for Rick and other folks within the group to keep in touch? Oh, yes. please do. It's it's very simple. It's me at rickvalicenti.com. Okay, all lowercase. Me at rickvalicenti.com. V-A-L-I-C-E-N-T-I. And that's C-O-M. Just kidding. Come on, guys. <laughs> and I put a link in the chat there to purchase our publication. Oh, uh, yeah. And I'll also drop a link to our website. And that's where we publish all our upcoming events and other ways to get involved with the club. So you want fries with that? <laughs> Super size me. Super size me. Good. <laughs> Later. Bye. Bye all. See ya. Thank you again. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Bye.